according to the PC has started. Before inside the cloud is up. And Sergeant Bradley with the opening statement, please. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City primary budget hearing on transportation. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your cameras. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or on silent mode. If you do wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council dot nyc dot gov again that is testimony at council dot nyc dot gov thank you for your cooperation we may begin chair thank you uh, to all of you sergeants and every men and women behind the the technology to be sure that all new yorkers are connected to this and many other budget hearing uh, led by uh, speaker Corey johnson and the rest of our colleagues Good afternoon and welcome to the City Council Transportation Committee hearing on the MTA calendar year 2021 and Dr. Boyet in the calendar year 2024 capital program. If you hear any sound, that's because I'm from a great playground here in the great borough of the Bronx. My name is Idanis Rodriguez and I had the privilege of chairing the committee, this committee. Two weeks ago, this committee heard testimony from the Department of Transportation and the Tax and Limousine Commission. Today, we will continue the budget process and we'll hear testimony from the MTA. Tragically, nearly 30,000 New Yorkers have died due to the coronavirus. I don't want any single one to die, regardless of the social and economic background. But the reality is that most people who died, they were Black, they were Asian, they're Latino, they were working class. Again, I don't want any single one of the 8.6 million residents and all visitors to die in our city. But most people who die, they die because of pre health condition and because they live in sick code that already they've been dealing with a lot of issues that together with the coronavirus took the life of so many great New Yorkers. One year out, it is clear how the pandemic has our society as we painfully continue to be separated from ones. Economic toll of the virus is unprecedented. Local businesses have been forced to shut it down, resulting in job losses and high unemployment. Thousands of these community cornerstones have closed permanently, changing the fabric of the city we love, a city built by New Yorkers that have come to this great city from all over the world. With a campaign to vaccinate New Yorkers on the way, COVID-19 cases have been declining and we can begin looking forward to transitioning back to a more open society. However, as we reopen, we must remain vigilant to ensure that lonely standing societal in inequity do not grow. We must also acknowledge that as we began seeing an increase in the subway ridership across the city, we must also begin seeing a return of our subways regularly, regular schedule. That include the restoration of the services for the C and F train, as well as the return of our overnight train services. I would like to thank the city essential workers, many of whom are from underserved minority community. Without their hard work, our city would not be able to function. Thanks to their dedication and sacrifice, our trains and buses have continued to run. Our cops are able to drive medical staff to hospital and deliver food, food to the needy. Our society, our grocery store remains stuck and our nurses and our doctors have been able to save lives. However, far too many workers have passed away, including more than 140 transit workers. I would like to take a moment of silence to recognize and honor the sacrifices of these workers, as well as the 30,000 New Yorkers who have fallen to this virus.
the MTA calendar year 2021 adopted operating budget is 17.6 billion and include more than 1 billion in city subsidy. Overall, the MTA requests over 16 billion in federal COVID related funding. To date, it is projected to receive approximately 15 billion. Over three similar plan for COVID related aid. This is in addition to nearly 3 billion borrow from the Federal Reserve Municipal Municipal Liquidity Facility. The MTA is mandated to have a balanced budget and in the absence of such, it may consider an acting service reduction, permanently wage freeze and fare increase beyond a schedule 4% increase. If enacted, this proposal, re proposed reduction for calendar year 2022 could impact 9,400 MTA workers and could include service reduction of up 40%. This doomsday scenario is one that we cannot allow, and I will be working with my colleague on the state and the federal level, Speaker Corey Johnson, and all my colleagues to ensure that the MTA is receiving the support that is receiving the support, the support that we must see more to see more transparency in the return of our train and buses services from the MTA. The authority adopted 2024, 2020, 2024 capital program totals 54 point billion and remained in change from last year. However, congestion pricing revenue was estimated to cover 27% of this plan, which was adopted prior to COVID-19 pandemic. Today, the infrastructure required to start congestion pricing it is not yet in place and federal approval is still needed. Moreover, the state has authorized the MTA to divert congestion pricing revenue to fill budget gap in the MTA expenses budget. It is unclear how this will affect the authority's capital plan, including former New York City Transit Authority President and the Byfield Trans Transformation Plan. Overall, we look forward to hearing the MTA updated the committee on the state and the transit system and how we will navigate this ongoing fiscal crisis. We also expect the NTA to discuss its plan to reinstate overnight subway services, which has been uh, suspended since May 16, 2020. The subway system is the lifeblood of the city and ensuring overnight services return is essential to transitional out, transitioning out of the pandemic and allow for more equ equitable transit system to all New Yorkers. Before we had the MTA from the MTA, I will now have the committee council to recognize their members in a tender and swear in the representative for the MTA. But before passing to the council, uh, Elio, I would like also to thank Brooklyn Borough President, uh, 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 Public Advocate Jomani William, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson, all of them together, Eric Adams, Corey Johnson, Jomani William, Gail Brewer, uh, Brad Lander and many others who went today together with dozens of members of TWU. We were there at the press conference at noon at West 4, calling for the MTA to restore the services, especially the C and the F, that is so important for residents that we have in New York City who rely on them. So with that, I go back now to Elliot. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Elliot Lynn, Counsel to the Transportation Committee of the New York City Council. Um, we have been joined by council members Diaz, Ku, Holden, Minchaca, Cabrera, Rose, Miller, Levine, Reynoso, and Lander. Um, I want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you're called on to testify when you will then be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called and I'll periodically announce who the next panelist will be. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Unless indicated by the chair, we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including answers. I will now call on our panelists from the MTA. Uh, Chief Financial Officer for New York City Transit, Jaibala Patel, MTA Acting Director of Management and Budget, David Keller, and MTA Director of Capital Program Management, Stephen Barang. I will now read the affirmation, and then I'll call on each of you to confirm your response aloud for the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Jaivala Patel? I do. David Keller? I do. 
Stephen Brang. I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Um, thank you very much. Hello, and thank you for having us today. My name is David Keller. I am the MTA's Acting Director of Management and Budget. I am joined virtually by Jay Balas Patel, Chief Financial Officer for New York City Transit, and Steve Barang, Director of Capital Program Management. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Chair Rodriguez, Corey, um, Speaker Corey Johnson, and the rest of the council to the direct aid provided to the MTA in the adopted budget for 2021 and for its continued contributions to the 2015 to 19 and 2020 to 24 capital programs. Your support is very much appreciated as the MTA looks forward to the 21st century transit system that New Yorkers need and deserve. Before I go on, I'd like to thank um, Chair Rodriguez for the kind words that he has said for the New Yorkers who've lost their lives as well as the MTA employees who've lost their lives. We mourn the more than 150 employees at the MTA who have lost their lives. And in our mind, they are the true heroes of our transit system. As you know, the last year has been the most difficult period the agency, in agency history for the MTA. Our chairman, Pat Foy, spoke in detail about the challenges we continue to face last month when he appeared before the Transportation Committee alongside New York City Transit President Sarah Feinberg and Chief Financial Officer Bob Foran. In the time since that hearing, our problems haven't disappeared. However, they've been greatly helped by the passage of the American Rescue Plan. We're grateful to our federal partners, especially President Biden, our hometown hero, Senate Majority Leader Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, and the entire New York delegation for their tireless hard work and support. The legislation provided an historic level of funding for mass transit, including an estimated $6.5 billion for the MTA. That's on top of the roughly $8 billion in emergency aid we received previously through the CARES Act and CARISA. We were also able to borrow another $2.9 billion through the Federal Reserve's Municipal Liquidity Facility. The $14.5 billion in combined emergency COVID funding has been a critical lifeline for the MTA over the past 12 months and, and go a long way towards addressing the $16 billion four-year deficit we were facing, and we are very grateful. As you are aware, we have been looking at 40% cuts in service to the subways and buses, as well as thousands of employee layoffs. But the arrival of this latest federal relief package allows us to move away from our worst case budget scenarios. Additionally, as Chairman Foy has specified, the federal emergency assistance will enable us to begin contract negotiations with our labor partners and move forward with previously agreed upon contractual obligations. It has been well documented that COVID's impact on mass transit was enormous, surpassing that of even the Great Depression. Ridership fell by 95% on the subways at the peak of the pandemic, and even now it is still down about 70%. On buses, we're hovering around 50%. Those precipitous declines in ridership and revenue wreaked havoc on our budget, which is half made up of funds raised from fares and tolls. Dedicated taxes and subsidies also dwindled over the course of the pandemic. But there have been some positive signs as we move forward and the city begins to reopen. We recently announced our subway ridership hit a pandemic high of 1.9 million trips and our bus ridership is also showing signs of rebounding, now frequently topping 50% of pre-pandemic levels. While both are still significantly below our pre-pandemic levels, they are headed in the right direction. We look forward to welcoming back more and more customers in the months ahead. So please, wear a mask and take a ride with us. It is still the quickest and safest way to get around. Meanwhile, beyond just helping us fight to keep the lights on, the latest round of federal aid brings new possibilities for our historic 2020 to 24 capital program, which has been on pause because of the pandemic. Important projects like modernizing signals on our subway lines, making more stations accessible, bring Long Island Railroad service to Grand Central Terminal, expanding Metro North service to Penn Station with four new stations in the Bronx, and extending the Second Avenue subway to East and Central Harlem are again under funding consideration and discussion. The MTA goal is to award at least $6.2 billion in total work to third-party contractors or in-house teams in 2021. Our goal for the first quarter is $865 million, and we are on track to meet that target. And if the federal government acts to advance the environmental review process for our central district tolling program, that is even better news for the capital program. We're encouraged that the Biden administration has said it would prioritize review of our application, which sat dormant for more than 18 months under the previous administration. We are committed to advancing progress as much as we can at every level of the MTA in the years ahead. Part of this work includes taking a look at internal operations to rain and cost. We are doing our part through agency consolidations, significantly cutting overtime and major reductions in the use of consultants. 
Regarding overtime specifically, our latest report shows the MTA has achieved $244 million in savings since 2018, a a decrease in overtime of 18%. This was the first time in a decade that the MTA has achieved two consecutive years of overtime reductions, and we are on track to reduce overtime spending by $1 billion total between 2020 and 2024. This is great news, but we know our work isn't done yet. To build on this success, we will be moving forward with a range of initiatives to further drive down controllable overtime and address potential abuses as quickly and as efficiently as possible. We're confident that there are better days ahead for the MTA, and we look forward to working with the City Council to find the best path forward. A strong MTA is essential to New York and the nation's economic rebound, and we're eager to help get the recovery of the economy back on track. Thank you, and we're now happy to take your questions. Thank you. Uh, how how soon do you feel that we can be? And, and per, first of all, before asking the question, I also would like to uh, recognize that a, a few months ago we had Pafo and the other uh, leadership of the MTA being in front of us. Uh, so the fact that we have also uh, other members of the leadership. Uh, that they are experts in issues related to finance and other, uh, but without the participation of the PAFO and other members of the whole team, is not uh, any uh, reduction of the respect that they have for the work that we're doing and the level of collaboration. But this is something that as we plan together with, with for this hearing, uh, 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 we, we thought that uh, we could have this conversation with the great team that they sent to us today, since we also have the chairman and other members of the team who are not with us a few months ago in another hearing, very related to the discussion that we are having right now. Uh, how soon can we have the MTA ready to reopen uh, the, those two hours that the trains are closed right now? Thank you. Um, so we are looking at this as our chairman Foy has said previously, um, we'll open up our subways overnight for those two hours when we can do so safely. By tomorrow, the governor call and say, let's open it on Sunday because it's good for her. MTA will uh, announce that it's open. So I think that you know, we should have a better plan. I think it's a fair expectation that we can have a plan on when is that we are going to be having the train on the train open 24 seven. So again, as we did for the sort of the 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. hour and then the uh, 4 to 5 a.m. hour as the city reopened, we committed to opening uh, with the phased opening and we will continue to look at uh, how the city reopens and we will make decisions based on that as, as we open up the city safely. We wanna make sure our customers and our employees are safe. We do, uh, we appreciate it, but I think as we know, uh, uh, this is at this moment, this is about, uh, you, you know, we need to reopen. Like all the study, all the numbers saying that you know, by giving those two hours so that we go back to celebrate that we are not only the largest transportation system in the whole nation, and we appreciate your leadership of you and many others. But this is about working class, who work in Delhi, who work in restaurants, and, and who live in the third community to be able to have access to 24 hours. And those two hours make a big difference. And I, and I, and I believe it, my call is not only to the MTA, but my call is also to the governor. So please use his powers, use see his resource. We need to have those uh, uh, two hours that the train being shut down, closed right now, open as yesterday. So I take your word. Uh, I want to keep it positive, but I just think that, you know, no one has been in the, in the battleground more than many of us. We know what it is to be in the city and not going to the home to go to the Hobson Valley or going to Canada to work from there. So we can tell you that those two hours are very important. Please advocate. I know that is beside what you and the leadership, the NTA would like to see happening, 
a lot had to do with Albany, and we need to be sure that the governor, you know, get his support and come on board and work with the MTA so that the train is open 24-7. What about on the C and the F train? Uh, uh, can we have any, uh, how are we doing? How are you guys doing from the MTA? I know that you are in the process also, a lot of conversation going on. Uh, our conversation moving forward, can we, you know, uh, do we have some positive expectation that, you know, that New Yorkers, especially those who rely on the, on the F and C train will be getting Full services uh, very soon. So, as you know, Chair, we are running 80% of our service right to um, uh, our, our customers that are is 30% of ridership. Uh, we continue to monitor ridership um, as the city, city continues to reopen. Um, we're continually in this in the system monitoring our ridership and. Um, We've been there many times during the week to make sure that they're crowding and, and other issues um, that are possible to see. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that, and um, hopefully in the future there there will be a you know response from uh, the MTA on the services. We're continually monitoring. Uh, currently, we're in court, right? So I, I can't comment any further on that. As we discuss in this budget, and as you know, most of my colleagues, myself, Speaker Johnson, being advocating for the city to always increase the contribution to the MTA, it, it, but also we want to be engaged, and I know that this is only just about you, those who are in front of us today, or even the chairman of the MTA, this is about the city and the state had to make a decision. In the past, Speaker Johnson and us asked for conversation to begin on the possibility for New York City to take over the New York City Transit. How will that bring a different way of how the city transit will be run in New York City take full control? I, um, Mr. Chairman, I think that's the type of conversation that would be best um, had with Chairman Foy when he comes back later this month. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank uh, you. During this process of COVID, uh, and, and as we are going back to you know, to our feet when it comes to, you know, uh, taking our city back, our economy, hopefully guys, you know, running the train 24 seven, restaurant, theater, sport institution being reopened and it, how is the MTA planning to work with the riders or the train to be sure that it, it individual riders continue doing their part? And I, I, I got to say that taking the train very often I, and the buses, I know that most people who use the train, they use this, their mask and they keep the, the, the distance. And what is in the budget, the projection that you have is and when it comes to how much will you need to continue doing the educational part of a, a riders know what you have to do to be pro, to, to protect themselves and protect others when it comes to COVID. Um, well, in 2020, we spent about $250 million to clean and disinfect the MTA system, both subways, buses, um, Metro North and Long Island Railroad. And so far in 2021, we have spent another $44 million through the first week of March. Um, <clears throat> we anticipate to spend about $300 million more on an annual basis going forward. It's already in our financial plan. The MTA continues with its mask force and we send people out. We also know that our customers have expressed um, comfort in knowing that we have been cleaning and disinfecting our system daily and vigorously. All right. And what do you think is, what will, what will it take uh, for uh, the buses uh, to enact a system-wide uh, all-door voting 
in all buses uh, in New York City. So I think that's that conversation, um, uh, Sarah provided an answer last month, but you know, as we roll out Omni, um, that, that will be possible even more. Um, currently we have readers um, for all our subway stations as well as our bus um, uh, fare boxes. Um, so as we roll out Omni and uh, in, integrate Omni into our system, I think that that would be a, a good possibility. Do we still have area in New York City where New Yorker has to take three buses to go from where they live to go to work? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question, Chair. It, as you know, when people are, it, it, it need to make a transfer from one bus to the other, right? It, it, we take for granted that all New Yorkers need to have a, to take only one transfer. But I know in the past there were places in Queens, there were places in Brooklyn where people had to take three buses a, because a second bus doesn't take them to the de destination. Have you found out if we still have area where in certain a, community, in the New York, it had to do like a, a two, three transfer. And if that will be the case, have you engaged in any conversation with some council members to address that situation or is a senator or assembly member? I don't have that answer in front of me, but we can definitely follow up with you um, working with our operations planning team to make sure that that uh, is reviewed. Okay, I have the question, but I want to go back to my colleague. And uh, so I bring him back to Elio so that he can then call those council on, uh, uh, on the order that they raised in him. Thank you, Chair. We'll now call on council members in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Um, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Um, first, we will hear from council member Miller Councilmember Miller. Good time, we'll begin. Councilmember, you need to unmute yourself. Am I unmuted? Yeah, yes you are. Okay, good. That, see, I did that without touching anything. Um, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the MTA team for being here. I have a number of questions, so I'm, I'm gonna kind of just try to get through them and, 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 and get your answers. So uh, prior to the pandemic, bus redesign was underway in all five boroughs and had been completed in the Bronx and Brooklyn and, and working on Brooklyn and Queens. Um, can we anticipate that, when can we anticipate uh, the bus redesign network uh, conversation uh, to uh, be re-engaged? And, and, and do you still maintain that that is a process that is, uh, should be course neutral considering that we are operating, particularly here in Queens, buses are running on old trolley lines, right? And that's how long it's been. So um, that would be the first question. And, and then, you know, I have so many, but in the interest of time, I wanna, my, my conversation here and question is, is around equi equity and accessibility to public transportation and because transportation is a great equalizer and, and the great chair just talked about the, the transit deserts in places like Queens. So the next question would be about um, access to public transportation and, and things like uh, expansion of the Atlantic ticket and uh, what can we see there and what have we learned in particular um, uh, um, by integrating uh, during COVID-19 uh, about integrating the transit system, uh, commuter rails and, and others and, and given access uh, coming out of COVID, uh, what can we see different? What can we expect? And can we expect certainly the expansion of Atlantic ticket uh, access to the commuter rails for New York City residents? Um, on, on, in the area of health and safety, you talked about um, the robust cleaning that occurs um, having been, and, and I know you guys are fairly new to this, but I spent 25 years um, employed at the, at, at the MTA, uh, last 10 as president and business agent as the Amalgamated Transit Union. 
And so we are certainly intimately familiar with, with what that cleaning process looks like. Um, what does future investment looks like? And the CDC guidelines uh, suggest that that is the most important um, aspect of health and safety or investment, or could we address load guidelines? We still getting phone calls, myself and, and, and many of my uh, colleagues are getting phone calls of overcrowded buses and trains, particularly overcrowded buses. Um, uh, we have legislation introduced, uh, uh, introducing legislation that addresses low guidelines and particularly low guidelines equitably because we know throughout the city, um, buses in the outer boroughs carry more folks than they do in the city. Uh, in the midst of the pandemic, is that something that we will be addressing as a matter of health and safety? Um, are we, how soon can we expect to have sufficient amount of buses to make sure that people are traveling and being able to respect those guidelines and, and, and more importantly, um, social distancing. And finally, uh, as I'm, I'm glad we have the financial folks here now because there is a, a uh, we'll talk about a um, fiduciary and fiscal responsibility um, to address your, the, the cost of labor. I know that there are many uh, labor unions that have uh, outstanding contracts. And while I know that you're gonna say that you are not prepared to talk about ongoing negotiations, I'm talking about negotiations that aren't ongoing, negotiations that are either at impasse and potentially in arbitration. Uh, going back to uh, past practice and, 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 and things like the, the Zuccotti decision in which the MTA uh, arbitrated unsuccessfully six or seven different times. Um, I know you're not gonna go down that road, but considering that there is a pattern that has already been established, have you lived up to that responsibility and set aside the dollars that would offer that pattern to the bargaining units that do not now have a contract? Um, so I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, I will start with the, your last question, um, um, council member. Um, in terms of pattern bargaining, um, the MTA, the MTA financial plans um, in, include pattern bargaining in its in its dollars. However, I cannot comment on any negotiations whatsoever, as you noted yourself. Um, so I think that probably um, addresses to the great. I noted degree that what you I can. say that. I didn't note that you couldn't do it. So you you're saying that the money is there has been set aside to meet the pattern that has already been established. That's our budgeting mm -hmm. practice. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, and the second item I'll talk about very briefly. Time has is... expired. No, that, no, that's for me, not for you. Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just touch briefly on the Atlantic pilot, ticket pilot. Um, it continues without any plans to discontinue it. Um, the intention was to use the pilot extension to evaluate more data before the next round of tariff hearings. So the MTA board could evaluate merits and decide on permanently incorporating the tariff into the Long Island Railroad tariff. Um, but of course, with, with the pandemic, we have not been able to do a full analysis and, and go on and talk to customers about their likes and dislikes. Um, the field study was intended to be done in 2020. Um, we plan to relaunch the study and the analysis sometime later in 2021 or very early 2022 based on how much ridership rebounds and then we'll have a better idea about the Atlantic ticket. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just point out in terms of other um, other MTA transit uses for um, New York City um, residents. The um, Outer Borough Transportation Account, which was supposed to fund um, intercity railroad tra um, discounted travel, along with several other items, um, the Outer Borough Transportation Fund has not been funded because the revenues from the poor hire vehicle surcharge have not come close to even hitting the first 300 million, which was anticipated for the subway action plan. Um, forecasts from the state, which is what we base our um, for higher vehicle fee surcharge revenues on, because we do not have a long history of it, um, indicate that probably that'll start um, hitting the outer borough transportation account again in 2022. And in regards to the, uh, the bus redesign, it still remains a priority for the MTA. Um, due to the pandemic, you know, there's an impact on our staff resources and the challenges to safely conduct uh, public outreach with community stakeholders under the prevailing social distancing guidelines. 
Um, so the projects are currently on hold. Um, you know, uh, the sessions require engagement from our operations planning team, GCR, um, to meet and discuss various routes, bus stops. So it's, it's a very sort of hands-on type of uh, outreach that we do for bus redesigns. Um, as soon as it's, uh, we're able to do this safely, we will could open it up and continue to do uh, progress on the, the redesigns. And, and, and I'm sorry, Jamaica Depot. Um, well, the, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, Council Member, uh, the uh, design is underway. We have chosen option A, which is a one-story uh, depot with on-roof parking and ground-level parking that has a 30-foot sound barrier that surrounds it. Uh, you know, we've been coordinating closely with uh, community and, and uh, uh, interests and stakeholder interests. Uh, we anticipate awarding that contract towards the end of next year. Uh, with completion to be approximately 42 months later, which would be towards the end of 2026. Ooh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and then the low guideline stuff, you could send that. Okay, thank you. Before, before we call in also the, uh, our next call, I also want to thank the men and women at TW also for, you know, being a if the voice of all the writers and the voice of all the workers. So it was very uh, important that we were standing together today at the press conference. And I know that there's conversation going on. There should be conversation again between TW and you guys. But I just hope that everyone, all New Yorkers recognize the work that they're doing and only representing the interests of the workers by representing the interests of the whole city. Thank you. Back to you, Elio. Thank you, Chair. Um, before we move on to the next member, I'd like to acknowledge that we were also joined by Councilmember Levin. Um, next, we will hear from Councilmember Ku. Councilmember Ku. Yeah, time will begin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, representatives from MTA. Uh, I have a public safety issue question. Now, now, today, my wife's supposed to go to the city. Uh, usually, she takes a train to go to the city. But right now, she, today, she decided not to. She want to spend like, $30 to use car service you know, because of the, uh, all these uh, um, hate crime against Asians or hate crime against, or crime against anyone. Now, today, yesterday, today, I read the news, uh, the day news, they, they even have a passenger urinating to another passenger. Uh, and it's so disgusting. And if you're a passenger, you might get a stash or stat or, or, or any kind of physical abuse you can encounter on the train. So my question is, what steps are you, you guys doing to alleviate the anxiety and the hesitancy uh, for like people to use the train? Because you always talk about the uh, ridership is done, but if you don't impose uh, a public uh, safety issues, uh, people are afraid to use the subway or the bus. So are you doing anything? I, I know you have requested the M more police have you considered they like, have the MTA public safety agents on the platforms or on, on the trains? So I think you 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 hit the sort of nail on the head. We've called for a, an additional 1,000 cops in our system, right, to provide mental health services in our subways and and our platforms. Um, this is a call that our chairman Foy has made, as well as uh, President Feinberg. It's it very important for us to have additional NYPD officers to help protect our customers and employees in these cases. Um, the MTA also has, you know, uh, anti-Asian hate, hate crime campaign going on right now. So we support the community in, in that fashion. Yeah, but, but I don't see any concrete steps you, you guys doing, you know, because hate crime still happen every day, not only against Asians, but against everyone. No, so how do we solve this? 
I mean, you have to do it immediately, not just the, the, the last month, uh, Chairman Foy has a, 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 a bunch of meeting with city council. I asked him the question, but a month gone by, I mean, there's nothing being done. So uh, we're a transit agency, right? We need the partnership of NYPD and additional uh, mental health services to continue to help with this issue. Uh, we have our MTA PD that, uh, you know, uh, con uh, co currently patrols, excuse me, um, our, our system, but this is really uh, more about NYPD officers being in our system to help us. And then you have to create a state of urgency, you know, making sure, you know, this is a top issue uh, for your agency. And we were asking the mayor, the governor to help, you know. I mean, city council, we already know this, but we don't have uh, anybody to send to you. The governor has the National Guards, you know, they have the police, and the uh, NYPD has police, MTA has police. So between uh, 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 all these agencies, you can you can do some jobs and have some agents patrol the platform. Thank you. <laughs> I'm finishing my questions. Thank you, Council Member. Um, are there any other council members at this time that would like to ask a question of the MTA? Okay, uh, seeing none at this time, uh, Chair Rodriguez, we can turn it back, back over to you if you have any follow up questions. I, I think that right now, if and, and I do appreciate, you know, all the thing of the or the or everyone on the MTA is especially, you know, we will and and Marino so being very helpful from the governmental relations side. I, I and, and I appreciate that you guys, you know, accommodate your time to come back and be in front of us today. I think that for me this is about, you know, prioritizing you know, the important to invest to it restore the services, but also, you know, all those questions related to upgrading the signal system, you know, it, there are part of this conversation. So it, it, do you, if you have any update on it, uh, how are we doing with scheduling wise when it comes to uh, the plan, capital plan to upgrade in the signal system, it, it, is that, has that plan been delayed as a result of the financial crisis? Or it, what do you anticipate will be the plan to continue upgrading the signal system? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as you know, I'm sure we have uh, three uh, signal projects, CBT signal projects underway, CBT West, uh, Queens Boulevard West, uh, and uh, Culver CBTC, and 8th Avenue CBTC. The balance of the CBTC uh, projects, which are in the 20 to 24 program, have currently not yet started uh, due primarily due to our, the financial impacts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but we are uh, looking to start those as some design is underway, and uh, we look forward to advancing those as financial resources and uh, uh, possibilities uh, provide themselves uh, opportunities to do so. Okay. And we, when it comes to it, women and minority WMB. It, it, of course, I appreciate also the conversation that I have, I have with the director for the women and minority uh, program at the, uh, the MTA and, and looking to continue having that conversation, bring all the others in, in New York, in other individuals that already have their own small businesses so that they can connect it with you. It, what, do we, what do we anticipate in this voyage coming will be the percentage of, of, of con projects and resources designated for women and minorities. So uh, council member, uh, in, in the, the last uh, New York state fiscal year, which is 2019, 2020, uh, the MTA uh, spent $772.5 million on MWBE 
uh, uh, contractors uh, or inclusion in, in our contracts. That's at a 27.2% uh, uh, rate. Um, that made us uh, the highest ranked uh, agency in the state of New York for uh, New York State uh, inclusion. Uh, we also uh, have spent $304 million uh, last in that same time period on federal contracts. Uh, we are fully committed to uh, meeting our obligations uh, for both uh, uh, state and federally funded contracts for MWBE. And we also have a uh, small business mentoring program, which we are actively uh, uh, pursuing and, and uh, managing and encouraging participation. So uh, MWBE contracts can uh, become prime contractors. And so uh, that, that's the status of our MWBE program at the time. So uh, again, uh, looking to continue having this conversation with you guys, I think that, you know, even though the number, you know, look good, but when it comes to it, it, what percentage of those are New Yorkers who live in the five boroughs and how we can do better, this is something, again, that I'm looking to continue addressing with you guys. So, uh, Looking to continue uh, to have that conversation with the director of WMB, WMB, BNB, BNE, and, and the other staff of the MTA to connect more local residents or the five boroughs to that opportunity of an institution that has the value of $1 trillion, where some people make huge amount of money, but still there's a lot more that we can do to connect a, a local women, black, Latino, minority with those opportunities. So with that, it, I would like to thank you guys. It, I hope that it has, we were here and members of the public, starting representative of the TWU, that you will hear their testimony. Their testimony, and if you had to step out to, as you usually do, to leave your, your representative to hear the testimony from the TWU and members of the public. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, on behalf of the entire MTA, thank you again for hosting us and giving us this opportunity today. And there will definitely be representatives listening to the public's um, comments. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak unless otherwise instructed by the chair. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you. Uh, please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Um, our first panelist will be Eric Logal. Eric. Your time will begin. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, everyone who's here. Um, so I'm gonna speak about the C and the F line service reductions. Um, my name, of course, Eric Logel. Um, I'm vice president of rapid transit operations with the Transport Workers Union, Local 100. I represent the more than 7,000 subway conductors, train operators and tower operators who move New York. I'm testifying today to voice opposition to the MTA's service cuts on the C and the F lines. The reduced service is more than just an inconvenience for riders who have to wait longer in stations to be picked up. It's a health hazard. By running fewer trains, the MTA is exacerbating crowding conditions on platforms and inside trains. Instead, we should be doing everything we can to give riders and workers as much space as possible as we continue to battle COVID-19. The authority cut service on all subway lines after the pandemic hit last year as ridership dwindled to about 300,000 a day. Um, it was restored on all subway lines except for the C and the F. The F now has 29 fewer train runs and the C now has eight fewer runs. The gaps between trains have increased by up to 12 minutes compared to before the pandemic. That might've made some sense very early in the pandemic, but ridership has been increasing as more and more people get vaccinated. In recent weeks, the number of daily riders has been between 1.7 and 1.9 million. The MTA needs to restore service and restore it now. The service reductions have also imposed significant hardships upon our own union members, the operating crews who serve riders on the C and the F lines, 
In addition to being displaced from their normal job assignments for many months, some members have been put into new job schedules, which severely impact their ability to manage their own lives, including family and child care responsibilities. The New York State Public Authorities Law requires transit officials hold public hearings before making service cuts like this. The law also says the authority has to give the mayor and city council 30 days written notice so the city can hold proper hearings. The MTA never held those hearings. There is no economic justification for these service cuts. The MTA has received many billions of dollars from the federal government. So I urge you to call on the MTA to restore full service on the C and F Time line. Has expired. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any panel, any council members that have questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next panelist will be Arthur Schwartz. Arthur. Good time, we'll begin. Uh, good afternoon, uh, my name is Arthur Schwartz. I am special assistant to the president of the Transport Workers Union and council. Um, I just want to add one thing to what Eric said, and that's that this committee should understand, as we showed in court last week, that it has the power to require the, the MTA and the New York City Transit Authority to come before the City Council, report all cuts in service, and the City Council has the power to request public hearings. I dare say that in the 40 years since that law was put into effect part of the public authorities law, sections 12054 and 120415, that has rarely happened. And probably most current city council members do not even know that that right on the part of the city council exists. Um, we went to court and said last week to Judge Frank Perry that these cuts in the C and the F train were in fact becoming permanent and Judge Perry, and we said that they had not notified the city or given the city council the opportunity to ask for public hearings. And the, the judge agreed with us. He stopped the, the permanent implementation of the CNF cuts. And then this morning actually extended that injunction until April 7th. Uh, this city council should be demanding, uh, not just the union should be demanding, but the city council should be demanding its role not just by having this hearing, but by having public hearings and demanding that the, the MTA hold public hearings if it really intends to go through with the CNF train cuts. I also wanna talk about another issue that is highlighted this morning in the New York Times. On New York, the New York City uh, Transit Authority uh, operating budget is the most rider funded budget of any transit authority in the United States. Uh, the, the consumers, the people that ride the trains are the ones that pay a majority, the overwhelming majority of the money that runs the, the transit authority. That wasn't always the case. There was a time before the 1977 and 78. Time has expired. Can I finish, may, may I finish one more sentence? Yes, yeah, summarize your testimony. Uh, where New York City uh, funded the authority uh, I call on the city council to take up that responsibility now that you're doing budget and to put 1% of the city budget into the New York City Transit Authority operating budget, which would allow the authority to maintain service and lower fares. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, as a reminder, uh, written testimony can be submitted. Uh, the address is testimony at council.nyc.gov. I, um, I have done that. I did that. Thank you. Um, are there any council members with questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, our next panelist will be H.P. Schroer. H.P. Your time will begin now. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. For the record, I'm HP, a World War II veteran and director of UMIWI, a veteran organization representing 12,000 veterans attending colleges in New York City. My sole mission for the last four years was to get the MTA to charge veterans the same price as seniors. Three years ago, the council and the mayor approved giving veterans attending college 
a discount. Unfortunately, after three years of the 12,000 eligible veterans, only 700 have received a discount because of restrictions imposed by the mayor. So we decided to do something about it. <clears throat> Three bills were established in the state legislators later, later, which enable all veterans to purchase discounted fares. The bills stipulate the money will be supplied by the state and only be used for a veterans discount. Sadly, although supported by the public and the majority of the legislature, they have languished, languished in committees. Why? A lack of money and a commitment to fund them. The American Relief Act is supplying the state and the MTA with billions of dollars. It is estimated it would take two cents from every fair to fund a veteran's discount. Yet the governor and the MTA have not taken any action to pass the bills. If you want to thank veterans for our service, then give meaning to the words by demanding the mayor keep his promise, demanding the MTA put a veteran's discount in its budget, and demanding the governor pass the bills and announce on Memorial Day a veteran's discount on the MTA. I ask you, isn't the service and sacrifice of veterans for the country worth two cents? I thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, our next panelist will be Kevin Jones. Kevin. The time will begin. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you to the members of the committee for allowing me to testify today. My name is Kevin Jones. I'm the Associate State Director of Advocacy at AARP New York. We represent 750,000 members of the 50 plus community in New York City. AARP New York believes that the MTA's network of subways and buses remains a lifeblood of New York City, and we stand committed to ensuring that the system provides safe and reliable transportation for our members and all New Yorkers citywide. Despite the unprecedented challenges that the MTA has faced as a result of the pandemic, the MTA system prior to the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic was far from perfect and played with a host of issues, especially as they relate to the overall accessibility of the transit network. The overwhelming majority of New York City subway stations remain inaccessible for people with disabilities and older adults with mobility issues. A 2018 study published by the New York City Controller's Office found that only 24% of, um, of the subway's 472 stations were accessible. The controller also found that the majority of neighborhoods that lack access to a single ADA accessible station are predominantly uh, communities of color in the outer boroughs of the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. In addition, thousands of residents um, in the outer boroughs of the Bronx and uh, Queens and Brooklyn also lack access to nearby public transit options entirely, which essentially rendered, uh, renders them in transit deserts. These pervasive accessibility issues diminish the quality of life for 50 plus New Yorkers and often limit an individual's access to quality employment and healthcare opportunities, as well as other critical services offered by the city. The MTA has made notable commitments to address these issues in recent years, by prioritizing ADA station accessibility projects in the 20, uh, 2020 to 2024 capital plan, as well as undertaking the New York City Transit Fast Forward Plan. That these project remain suspended, projects remain suspended due to the unprecedented impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, we commend the work this, of the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, the New York Congressional Delegation, and the Biden administration in passing the American Rescue Plan and are eager to see the MTA is receiving an additional $6.5 billion in emergency aid to offset the financial losses from the pandemic. As the MTA becomes more financially stable and looks to restart many of the fire. projects, we urge the agency to begin prioritizing, begin by prioritizing the completion of ADA accessible stations. Um, I will submit the rest of the testimony in writing, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any council members with questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, seeing none, I'll turn it over to Chair Rodriguez. Well, thank you to and, and everyone from the MTH for coordinating this hearing. 
Thank you to my colleague. Thank you to the speaker. Uh, working together again with Rupi Moore President Eric Adams, and uh, everyone that joined the hearing, the press conference today, including a, a, a speaker Corey Johnson, Councilmember Lander, uh, Jomani Williams, Gabe Brewer. I know that advocating together, we will be able to restore the funding. With that, this hearing is adjourned.